Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's Lunch and Learn with the Doctor on Foot Care. My name is Kathy Churn and I am a Consumer Health Librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by St. Peter's University Hospital and the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Our speaker today is Dr. Thomas J. Gibbons from Gibbons Foot and Ankle Group in East Brunswick. Dr. Gibbons, a member of St. Peter's University Hospital's medical and dental um, staff, is a graduate of the University of Delaware and Pennsylvania College of Podiatric Medicine. He completed a foot and ankle surg surgical residency program at Germantown Hospital and Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and is licensed to, to practice podiatry in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Dr. Gibbons is a member of the American Podiatric Medical Association and the New Jersey Podiatric Medical Society and a fellow of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. He has served as secretary of the Central Division of the New Jersey Podiatric Medical Society and is board certified by the American Board of Podiatric Surgery. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Participants' microphones are automatically muted and webcams off. The recording will be available at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our speaker will answer questions at the end of the talk. Our speaker will not be able to offer medical advice to attendees during this program. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Dr. Gibbons. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can all hear me. Uh, I'm Dr. Thomas Gibbons um, from Gibbons Foot and Ankle Group. Um, today, we're gonna talk about some foot and ankle issues. Uh, hopefully this will be a nice uh, give and take. We'll do a nice question and answer afterwards. Um, but first I would like to thank uh, Kathy Chern uh, with East Brunswick Public Library and also Crystal Mui um, at St. Peter's um, for setting all this, this up. Um, I figure the first thing, uh, most people don't really understand what a podiatrist is. Um, what, uh, so podiatrists do four years, obviously four years of college, then you do four years of medical school. Um, then you do usually an internist, uh, an, an internal medicine rotation, or you jump right into a surgical residency program. Most of the residents the doctors today are, are surgically trained, not all. Um, that doesn't mean they're board certified in surgery. That just means they, they're going through a program. So that's anywhere from another one to four years. So I think a lot of people are kind of shocked when they hear how long we have to go to school for. Um, but um, that's some training that I, I, I don't know if all of you know that. Um, I work uh, specifically with some of the surgical residents that rotate through St. Peter's and just a lot of real sharp young doctors. And it's uh, my pleasure to be able to train them in surgery. So um, what we're going to do today is we're going to we're going to talk about um, a various uh, mishmash, if you will, of, of different problems. Um, the foot and ankle is so complex and we could pick one subject and I could lecture on it for an hour. Um, so what we're going to do is just, we're going to just pick some things. I think you guys will be either relative to you or spark a little interest. So one of the most common things are, are fungus and fungus nails. Okay. So um, of course there's uh, topical treatments out there and they work pretty pretty well on skin issues when it's related to fungus, but um, it's, a, it's a tough go when you have some severe fungal toenails. Um, there's some really good uh, medications out there that are topical, but it's hard for a topical to get into the nail, make a right hand turn and get into the root of the nail. It's, it, it's practically impossible. So if you catch it early, the topicals are great. If you don't, there's oral medications um, uh, and there's debriding. You know, they get the fungal nails get thick. That means when they get thick, they get painful. So podiatrists um, 
you know, Gibbons foot and ankle, what we do is we'll grind them down and we'll thin them out for you. And that makes the nail grow a little faster while you're using the treatment. And it also makes it less painful for you in your, in your shoes. Um, oral medications. So years ago, the oral medications had a really bad stigma attached to them, you know, regarding, you know, liver problems. Um, but it, it, they've been, um, uh, they've been studied and there's no black box warning anymore. But what I do and what we do at Gibbons Foot and Ankle is we'll, if we decide we're gonna put you on an oral medication, we'll do what's called a hepatic function profile. And we will send you out for blood work for your liver enzymes. And if your liver enzymes come out great, it, it doesn't matter what medications you're on. It doesn't interact with any other medications. Um, but it is metabolized through your liver, which most medications are. So you want to have a nice, healthy liver. So if someone's elderly and they want to go on the oral medications, or even if they're younger and they want to go on the oral medications to get rid of these fungal nails, we'll draw some blood or, or we'll send you out to the lab and we'll get a hepatic function reading. And then once we start the Medicaid, if everything is good, which 90% of the time it is, if everything is good, the tests come out great, then we'll start you on the medication. And about a month later, while you're on the medication, because you have to be on the medication for three months, pill a day for three months. Once you're on that, then what we'll do is we'll retest your liver enzymes and see how you're doing. Um, and God, I'd say in the last, I mean, I've been in private practice now for 31 years, almost 32 years. In the last 20 years, um, I think probably I've had to take maybe two patients off the oral medications um, just because their liver enzymes spiked and then we took them right off. And the cool thing is, goes right back to normal, um, which is nice. Um, but anyway, that's that's fungal uh, nails, enough, enough uh, with that. Uh, I wanna jump into some sports medicine, okay? So we're, like I said, we're gonna be all over today. We're gonna, try to hit some hot topics. So um, let's start by talking about uh, your children, your grandchildren, um, they're all playing sports. Uh, and the one thing that um, a, a lot of us don't realize is we're not born with all of our bones in our feet. You, know, you have 26 bones, not counting sesamoid bones. And what happens um, is uh, children, what they'll do is they'll injure their growth plates. So you don't get certain bones until you're three, then you don't get your sesamoid bones till you're 12. So there's, there's the great thing about that is children's feet are really mobile, really flexible. So usually they don't injure their foot or their ankle because there's not much to break there. It's all soft tissue, it's all cartilage, it's all growth plates. Okay, but then as time goes on, they fill in with the actual bone. So when you come into our office and we x-ray them and we see, you know, certain bones forming at certain times, we know, okay, they're, they're, you're on schedule. Your growth rate is on schedule. You are X years old and I see this bone, this bone, this bone. That's, that's perfect, okay? So when you're talking about children's feet being so pliable because the bones aren't formed yet, they are great candidates for prescription orthotics. Now, you don't wanna get them you know, orthotics when they're you know, two years old and things like that, but when they're five, six, seven years old and you're starting to notice that they have mom's feet, feet or dad's feet, foot tight and, and uh, you know, mom and dad has that that bunion or that really, really flat foot, that's actually the best time to get them in because we can actually cast them for orthotics. And the prescription, there's something called flexible flat feet. So some people have rigid flat feet and then you're, that's a tough one because you know the only way you fix that is surgically. But flexible flat feet, if you cast, you can cast them in orthotics and um, you can, actually get that flexible flat foot by the time they're an adult that they, they no longer have it. They have this great arch, um, which is something that most people don't realize. Um, you know, and the key though is what's called non-weight bearing 
casting. So one of my pet peeves are fellow podiatrists, um, chiropractors, uh, all kinds of doctors. They'll have you step into a mold. And the problem with that is it captures the, fl the flattened foot, it captures the deformity. And then they'd make the device, the prescription orthotic for that. And then what are they doing? They're giving you a device to put in your shoe that's actually capturing your foot in the bad position. So we don't do that. Um, what we do is we lay you back and we put your foot in the better position and cast it. And then we can also add additional correction to it, but that's called non weight bearing casting. And that's the difference between just, you know, a custom orthotic where you step into a mold versus a prescription orthotic where we're actually trying to change something. Okay. And with kids, the sooner you get that, the better, um, um, you know, the other thing, uh, stress fractures. Okay. So a lot of us are athletes and, um, you get an injury for your running and you don't, you don't particularly have to, um, have some kind of trauma, but just repeated uh, running, jumping, whatever your sport is, you get what's called a stress fracture. So what's a stress fracture? So a stress fracture is similar to a porcelain vase. So we've all seen porcelain vases. They have cracks in them, but they're not broken, okay? So the stress fractures, when you x-ray them immediately, the stress fracture doesn't show up, okay? So comes back and says, okay, you're clean. You don't have a fracture. Well, you may, you may have a stress fracture. And the wild thing is stress fractures will show up five to six weeks later. Why does it show up then? Because it shows up then when the body starts to try to patch the cracks in your bone, you know? So just imagine a wall with a crack in it and you're throwing spack, spackle on there and you're, you're patching it all up. Well, it takes the body some time to lay down, <clears throat> excuse me, lay down this calcium. And then you'll see it five to six weeks later, you'll, you'll say, wow, you, you have a stress fracture here. So even if you've been x-rayed um, and weeks go by and you're not, you're not getting any better, maybe you need a second x-ray because that's when stress fractures show up. They don't show up immediately. So that's some things that we deal with a lot with, with, um, with, you know, with, with sports medicine. So, um, oh, back to the growth plates with children. So, if, if very typical, one of the, well, let's pick soccer. The kid's playing soccer, he's playing the whole game, running, no problem. He comes off the field and he's limping to the car. That can injure, that's usually an injury to a growth plate, okay? And a lot of times, you know, the child's foot's so vascular that they're not really feeling it when they're playing. Now they can when it gets really severe, but that's kind of an early warning sign that says, hey, get, get to the podiatrist, get to the foot and ankle specialist, let them check you out. If it's a growth plate, they can do some simple padding, some simple things to do. Still keep your child playing their sport most of the time and, uh, and just look for some signs because you, you don't want those growth plates to become fractures of the growth plates because then that stunts a, 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 a the growth in a bone. So if you have all these bones growing at different times and then bang, you have one bone that all of a sudden is not growing properly because you have a, a fracture to that growth plate. That's an issue that needs to be addressed. Okay. And not surgically, conservatively. So, all right. Um, so now let's talk about something that a lot of us have had, including myself, and that's called plantar fasciitis. Okay. So a lot of people will say, uh, my doctor told me I have a heel spur, okay? Well, norm, usually what they're talking about, it could be posterior heel spur related to your Achilles, but usually what they're talking about is plantar fasciitis slash heel spur syndrome, okay? We say syndrome, why? Because you don't actually have to have a spur, but if gone untreated, the plantar fasciitis over time, 
you'll eventually develop a heel spur, which just makes it harder to treat. Um, now, years ago, when I was first out of my surgical residency, we would x-ray a person with plantar fasciitis, see they'd have a heel spur and say, ah, you got a heel spur, you gotta go to surgery. We gotta remove that spur, gotta take care, release the plantar fascia. We don't do that today. And if someone wants to remove that spur for plantar fasciitis, you know, you find another doctor because we don't do that today. Um, uh, people have spurs uh, all over their bodies. And if we can get the plantar fascia from pulling on the spur, then we relieve the pain. If there's no pain, who cares that there's a spur there? Correct? All right. So there's some conservative things you can do with, for plantar fasciitis. There's some exercises we set you up with, um, some NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to calm down the inflammation. Um, cortisone injections are used. We usually have a limit on those. Um, we do, this is one thing where prescription orthotics are usually very effective and that's on plantar fasciitis because the plantar fascia is, well, it's, it's like a cable and it's, it's not very vascular. A matter of fact, um, when we go in surgically and we release it, it doesn't even bleed. So the fascia is surrounded by musculature all around, but that, but the actual fascia is avascular. So it's more like a cable. And, and what happens is if we can increase your arch, what we do is we decrease the pull that that cable, the plantar fascia, has on your heel. If we can do that conservatively, that's why things like, you know, well, I'll always start out with the over-the-counter, you know, cheap arch support, put, you know, do some exercises, try an anti-inflammatory. If that doesn't, <clears throat> excuse me, then I get more aggressive. I'll do some cortisone injections or make prescription orthotics. And that'll also depend on the, the person's job. If they're, if they're on their feet all, all day long, um, some of my OR nurses, uh, a lot of them wear prescription orthotics, um, and it, it's because they're on their feet standing. The same, the same with warehouse workers, people that work behind cash registers, uh, anyone that, that waiters, waitresses, anyone that's on their feet a lot. By increasing the arch, you can decrease the pull of the fascia on the heel, and it usually makes the plantar fascia calm down. Now. That's about 80, 90% of the time, which is great odds. Now, there, there is a surgery now that, that we do called an EPF. It's called endoscopic plantar fascial release, okay? And it's not like the old days. It's, we actually go in with a scope, and the scope is about the third of a pencil. So it's very tiny and the scope has a, has a light on it, a camera on it, and I can slide blades through it. And we actually go in and release a portion, what's called the medial band of the plantar fascia. And we release that. And you get a stitch on one side, a stitch on the other side, and, and that's it, one stitch. Um, and you have a bandage on for about five days. And then after that, just a Band-Aid will get um, our con big construction workers, 250 pounds, 270 pound construction workers back to work in their boots in a week's time. I mean, it's, it's amazing, this procedure. So yes, you exhaust the conservative. And this is coming from me who likes to do surgery. That's what I'm, I'm board certified in, in surgery. Um, I train for it that you know, means years longer, but always exhaust the conservative. Okay? It should be your rule number one, okay? And then, but this is a case where you should not fear the surgery. This is one of the easier procedures that we do. It's also one of the easier procedures for the patients, which is, which is nice, you know, which, which is, uh, brings us to more surgeries and some of the innovations in surgeries that we're doing now. Um, 
So let's talk about one of the big ones is the bunions. Um, for all of you out there that don't know what a bunion is, it is actually your first metatarsal bone that has shifted out of place. And contrary to what most people believe, it's this growth on the side of your foot right by your big toe, okay? Just below your big toe, so that joint right there. So with that in mind, think, think of the first metatarsal bone that has swung out of place, that, that's your bunion bone. Think of it like a pendulum. So this pendulum has swung out of position and it's gone all the way over to an extreme and it's not gonna swing back in. And that's where things like prescription orthotics don't help. When, it, when you're, you're past that, this bone is out there and the only way it's getting back in is if we cut this bone, shift it back in. Now, keep in mind that there's, there's conservative stuff to do. You know, obviously wider shoes, um, you can try orthotics at a younger age if we're catching the bunion right away to slow down the progression. But orthotics won't help once that bone is way out there. The only thing that's going to bring that back in is surgery, okay? Um, and, and that joint alone, it's called the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, that, that bunion joint, okay? That bone alone, or that joint alone, there's about 20 different procedures, you know? So... There's everything from joint replacement uh, to literally just simple things where you just go in and, and remove some loose chips of bone that are in there and, and clean up some, some damaged cartilage um, to procedures, uh, like I said, where we actually replace the joint, uh, which, is, which is a great procedure. It's not, it's not one for our long distance runners because pounding would be too much for it. But for everybody else, it's, it's great. We get you know, men and women back on the golf course with joint replacements. It's, it's, a, it's wonderful. Um, more commonly, um, we actually have to cut and shift the bone. We swing it back in. Now, years ago, um, you would have to put certain pins in. Sometimes the pins protrude from the body or put some screws in. Um, now, uh, some of the great innovations is absorbable pins and screws. So these things just dissolve. So we'll cut and shift the bone, put it back in place just where we want it, just where you want it, where the function is, it, it is the joint moves well. Great thing about it, they just dissolve. So later on, you don't have to come back to me for another surgery saying, hey, my uh, screw is backing out, you know, or or that, that pin has shifted. These just dissolve. And they're, um, you know, these uh, biochemists have figured out a way to make the absorbable sutures into absorbable pins and screws. So while the bone is healing, the actual screen, uh, uh, screw or pin is actually dissolving. So it slowly dissolves over time while it's holding it in place. And it's just, a, it's just another great innovation that you know, we, have, we have come up with um, to keep people um, you know, quicker recovery, uh, less likely to, to need a follow-up surgery. I mean, we all know people that have had to go back and have you know, a, 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 you know, a plate removed or a screw removed. Um, and this is a way that you, you don't need to do this anymore. So. Um, at least when with certain things, there's times when we to, to do it, and that's where that's where the you know the digital X-rays come in, and we take a look and see. Right in our office, we can see your bone density, so we can see, okay, you know what we're going to need to do a certain type of fixation because your bone density uh, is not as great as someone else's bone density. So there's certain things that we know go better with certain bone types. And, and we do, we address it like that, which is, um, which is, which is um, you know, pretty, pretty much, uh, it's, it should be standard, it's not, which brings me back to uh, certification. 
So a lot of podiatrists are board certified in one thing or another. They're board, board certified in, in general podiatry or they're board certified in um, uh, sports medicine or they're board certified in surgery. But if they're board certified in surgery, you know they went on for a few more years. And then after that, they have to take surgical boards and then they have to they have to take more courses every they have to take the courses to keep up every year and then they have to go for recertification every so many years so if if you're if you're ever looking you know you're going you love your podiatrist but he's not board certified in surgery then that's when you seek out someone that is because they may have some kind of correction that the other doctor either can't do or won't do. Um, and it's another re reason why I love the CARES uh, facility at St. Peter's. Uh, they will not accept you as a surgeon unless you are board certified surgeon. Um, and that's why, as well as their anesthesiologists, their anesthesiologists there are all board certified anesthesiologists. And, you know, they, it, it, in CARES bylaws, you go in, your, your surgeon is with you and your board certified, board certified surgeon is with you, your board certified anesthesiologist is with you the whole case. They, they don't um, switch you off to a resident. Um, you know, it's all board certified doctors there. And I, you know, it's, it's why like, it's like a, state of the art and if i'm in the middle of a case it places like a candy store to me i i can oh i don't like that her bones a little softer than what i thought i want to use this bang they have it and we use it so there's all kinds of great innovations um i got a text today from a rep that wants to show me a new kind of staple so we'll do that we'll review that and 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 see and one thing I learned from my uh, surgical director uh, down in Philadelphia is you do not want to be the first doctor to do a new surgery. Uh, let them experiment on some other patients, uh, but not your patients. So uh, we kind of try to keep that in mind and, and live by that and, uh, and do what we know works and, and you know, go from there. Now, I don't know if you want me to keep uh, rambling on or do you want me to, well, I should say this. Um, so we, speaking of certifications, we have a website at gibbonsfootandankle.com. And because I'm board certified in surgery, I belong to the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. So if you go on our site, you then get access to their library. And that library is immense. It has videos, it has lectures on everything you can imagine with the foot and ankle. And the way you can get into that is you go through gibbonsfootandankle.com and then you, you click on, um, there's, there's an educational section. You click on that and then you can just look up whatever you like and you, you, you get a, a vast array of things dealing with the foot and ankle because I know today we're just touching on a, on a few subjects. So um, with that, um, I, think, I think we'll see. Should we uh, open it up for uh, questions and, and uh, answers? Kathy? Yeah, sure. So let's open it up for questions. So if you have any questions, just type into the chat box. I'll read it out loud to Dr. Gibbons. Okay. So a question that just came in, how often should orthotics be replaced? Okay. So that depends on what you're using them for. So right now, um, in my, I have, I have two pairs of orthotics. I have a pair that I work out in um, and then I have a, a totally different kind of pair for my dress shoes um, when I'm just standing and walking, that sort of thing. 
those orthotics will last me, I don't know, six, seven, eight years um, be, because I'm an adult and my foot's done growing. So once you get the foot in the right position, you want to keep it there. However, if you're running four or five miles a day, then yeah, then they may need to get replaced every two, three years. Well, the orthotic. Now, I my ones that I work out in, I actually refurbish them. So I remove all the soft stuff and I put all new soft stuff on there. So they come back like they're brand new. I, I leave the actual hard part of the orthotic alone because I like that. Um, but once that starts to flatten out on, on a runner after a, a few years, then what we do is at that visit, we come in and say, okay, you know, this is where we wanted your foot. Your orthotic is now flattening out. We need to replace it. And that could be just a few years, but, but we have patients that come in with orthotics that are 10 years old and say, how they doing? <laughs> yeah. So, so that all depends on your activity level. And then what, what type of shoe? I mean, I've made them for New York City ballerinas to high heels to running shoes. So we can make them out of almost any material. Um, and for and it all really depends on what we're making them for. You know, Mr. Jones's orthotics aren't going to be the same as Mr. Smith's orthotics. And that, that's the difference. Okay. I hope that helped. Okay. Thank you. And then another question. What causes keratin to start to build up under the toenail? It's pushing the nail up. So a lot of times, a lot of times what happens is what, what's underneath your nail is your nail bed and then a bone called the distal phalanx. Now, when we're younger, that distal phalanx, it's a tiny little bone, is flat, usually very flat. Now, genetically, some people have it a curvilinear bone and then that means the nails curve right from the right from birth but majority of us have flat nails when we're younger but what happens is the actual bone under the nail changes it gets a little what we call an exostosis or a little peak of bone and then the the bone itself is actually pushing up the flesh under the nail and then that causes the nail to buckle up so a lot of times it, it's actually from underneath i hope that helps and then for for stress fractures if it doesn't show up in x-rays how does one know that it is a stress fracture and what symptoms does it have okay so stress fractures are are painful um and they can be fine when you're not on them. So like if you're just sitting around or you're, you're sleeping, you're okay, all right? But then you go out and you walk for a mile and the further you get into that walk, the more it starts to hurt, okay? Um, they usually occur, they don't have to just occur, but they usually occur in what's called your metatarsal bones, all right? And yes, uh, they do eventually show up on x-ray because the body will start laying calcium down to start thickening that bone. The metatarsal bones are very thin, skinny bones, um, but very functional. And uh, you know, when they do crack, uh, the body will repair it eventually, okay? But, um, it helps to know and it helps to know to stay off of it and do what you got to do. Sometimes we have to put patients in either a surgical shoe or a walking boot for, you know, a few weeks time just to let it calm down. But eventually it shows up on x-ray. The person wants to know, would it heal by, would a stress fracture heal by itself then? Well, it, it, it depends. It, it, they usually do fit in your you're, you know, you're non weight bearing or you're put into a, a, a boot. Okay. Um, then they usually do. They'll, they'll usually have the body, but unless you have some kind of condition where your body has a hard time healing bones, then, then they don't. So if, if you were put in a boot, if you were put in a surgical shoe, if you were limited in your activity and you did this for, you know, six weeks, two months time, 
and you're still having problems, then maybe there's something else going on. Maybe you have a neuroma, you know, which is a, a whole nother thing I didn't talk about today, but it's an actual, you know, inflamed, injured nerve that happens quite frequently in, in, in the foot. So, so there could be something else going on there too. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, and then someone has a question. They have broken toe, but now there is a, a fungus, a nasty fungus 10 years later. Is this like a coincidence or is this related? It's probably not a coincidence. So funguses take advantage of a damaged area. So there's these things called dermatophytes and saprophytes and they're these fungal spores. And they love to take advantage of a damaged area, um, either the skin there or the nail there. Now, these fungal spores, they're in your house. They're outside, they're on trees, they're in the grass. And most of the time, very, very, very benign. But they are looking for a moist, dark environment. Fungus loves two things, moisture, darkness. It's why it's rare that people get fungal nails, except for a trauma to, to a finger, that it's rare that they get them in their hands um, be, because they're exposed to light. But our, our feet are just the opposite. We, we put shoes and socks on every day. At night we go to bed, we're under the covers, there's the darkness. We don't always dry our feet all that well, plus our feet perspire. So it's a perfect medium for a fungus. And a fungus just needs a little crack in your nail, a little split. And what everyone doesn't realize is if you look at your nails, they look like a nice shiny piece of glass. But if you were to look at it under a microscope, it looks more like a screen, right? So it's got these striations in it. Well, on a lot of us, we actually have an enzyme that actually helps fight off this fungus. But then there's some people that don't have that. And what happens is they're a little more prone to getting fungal infections. Now, you damage that toe or that nail, and that allows the fungus to get in. And it gets in, and it one spore, 100 spores, they're pretty much invisible. You can't see them. But over time, over years, that little area gets bigger and bigger. And then the next thing you know, your nail starts to change colors and it starts to get thicker. And depending on what kind of spores it is, or matophytes or saprophytes, they can be white, they can be yellow, they can be brown. So you'll see differences. Um, and and uh, yeah, that's the, 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 they're nasty little buggers, but they are opportunistic. So they will look, they'll look for an avenue to get in and then and then they have really the perfect medium in our feet with the moisture and darkness. So I hope that helps. Well, and then the person who had, a, who had the question about the fungus um, says, that's it. Thanks for solving that mystery. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah. And then for ingrown toenails, what are the typical treatments for it? So um, it depends. If it's one time versus chronic, if it keeps coming back, uh, if it keeps crumb, and then there's sometimes where it's really not the nail's fault, it's the skin is crowding the nail. So there's ways of keeping the skin away so that the nail can grow. Um, and then back to how the nail grows. Remember we were just talking about, you know, a flat bone, the nail grows out flat. If the, if the bone is peaked, then the nail gets that kind of keratin underneath it, that hard dead skin. And then that can be painful and then also can be an ingrown. So there's all kinds of procedures from just starting to, so this is the other thing. When your kids are young, if their nails are flat, this is toenails we're speaking of, cut them straight across. Don't cut them too short, but cut them straight across. Now that's the rule of thumb. As you get older and that, that nail doesn't sit flat anymore, you have to change that rule, okay? So you have to start arcing it a little bit to keep it, to keep it out of there. Now, there are procedures that we do right in the office where we actually remove the ingrown out of there. We'll numb it up, lidocaine if we need to, and then 
we can actually destroy the root of the nail. In that, we can remove the whole root of the nail, okay? That way the nail never grows back, or we can remove a portion of it where the nail just doesn't grow back in that one little section. And that usually does the trick. So we don't usually do that right off the bat. We usually will try, okay, let's see how this goes. Because it, the one where we remove it permanently, that's a permanent thing. So if we're removing part of the nail permanently, particularly with, you know, you know, women who want to paint their nail and like, you know, um, you know, we, we do worry about the cosmetic point of view. So, but there are permanent and temporary options. Yes. And then um, another question is, um, what are ways to prevent callus buildup on your feet? Okay, so everyone's skin's different. Um, and some people build up more callus than others. It's just, it's just a fact. You'll have someone who runs five miles a day and your feet will toughen up, they'll have some callus. And then they'll have another person that runs five miles a day and their calluses are thick. They're really what we call hyperkeratotic. They really build it up. So everyone's a little bit different. Um, general diffuse calluses aren't bad. Um, and you can use skin emollients, skin creams to do that. We, we, we have one in the office. It's this Kamea G and it actually has an acid in it. And it's a cream and you just, you rub it in and it's an exfoliant and it, and it takes down the hard dead skin. Okay. And you're, you know, over a month, two months, all of a sudden they get a lot softer. Okay. Bad calluses are corns and what we call porokeratosis where they're hard focalized plugs of callus where it's condensed to one small area. And you may have that within a bigger, more diffuse callus. The diffuse calluses usually don't hurt so much. These small corns or these plugs of hard dead skin, they hurt. And sometimes they're confused with warts. People come in and say, oh, no, your pediatrician sent you over, you got a wart or, or, your, or your internist sent you over. Okay, not a wart, you have something called porokeratosis where you actually have a plug of skin there um, and they hurt and they should be worked on. They should be try to minimize them and uh, uh, they're tough to get rid of permanently, but to be kept under control, we can easily keep them under control, which is good. So I hope that helped. Okay. And that, um, so don't have any new questions coming in. So we'll do a last call for questions. Okay. I'm just gonna wait like maybe like a minute in case someone's still in the middle fine. Yeah, fine. In the meantime, I, I just wanna uh they, they would they would uh well I just wanna thank my staff at Gibbons Foot and Ankle Group, uh you know, Jacqueline, Jennifer, Laura, um, they're the best. And um you guys, once you deal with them, you'll love them because, you know, they, they really have your best interest at heart, so. All right, so I guess that's it for questions. So thank you, Dr. Gibbons, for taking the time to present and also to answer all of our questions. And it's been a pleasure with you. Thank you. And for everyone who joined us, thank you for joining us. Um, we have a, another Lunch and Learn with St. Peter's University Hospital next month called Supporting Academic Success in Your Child by Understanding Developmental Disabilities. And that will be taking place on Friday, October 8th at 12 p.m. noon. So if you, uh, so for more information on that or to register, go to ebpl.org slash calendar. And thank you everyone for joining us for today's talk and take care and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. Take care. Bye-bye.